Well, hello and welcome to Rare Classic Cars again. I'm Adam, and we'll continue on with our Best of Worst of Porch Chat series. If you haven't seen one of these yet or you're new to the channel, welcome. We enjoy doing road tests of classic vehicles of yesteryear that you just haven't seen much anymore on the road. So not necessarily the Camaros, the Firebirds, the Challengers, Mustangs, etc., but those full-size cars or intermediate cars that families used to drive. And we also talk about various vehicles and engines, transmissions, and components, some of the pros and cons of them. So welcome if you're new, and if you're a returning viewer, thanks for coming back. Today we're going to talk about another worst of engine in the General Motors stable from that wonderful period in GM's history, the 1980s. Although this engine stretched into the 70s and the 90s even, and some people are probably going to get upset with me for putting this on the worst of list. But I will say that I think this engine, because it was so ubiquitous and used in so many different vehicles of the period, and arguably was such a departure from what people had experienced in owning General Motors cars before, I'm going to put it on the worst of list and let me know what your reaction is to that. I will start by saying it's generally durable and generally reliable, but it is very, very unrefined and crude, almost to the point that it belongs in a McCormick and Deering tractor. That's really what it, it sounds like. And that engine is none other than the Iron Duke four-cylinder engine produced from 1977 to 1993. There was 2.5 liters and 151 cubic inches. And no, this is not the same as the Iron Duke engine in the Chevrolet 2. Not really any relation aside from a little bit of a distant, uh, yeah, kind of a distant cousin in a certain way, let's say. And I'll explain why I said that in a second. So as I mentioned, this engine came out in 1977. It was in the Pontiac Sunbird, the Astra, the Ventura, and the Phoenix. And it had an interesting just origin in, in gestation. So remember, this is at a time when General Motors had not great success with some of the four-cylinder engines, like the Vega 2.3 liter engine. that was perceived to be, even though it was overhead cam, it was also perceived to be crude, had quite a bit of vibration, and didn't have as best a power that it could have in the lower RPM range. So GM's desire was really to stem that and then also improve the durability and the perception of durability. So the Vega, with its aluminum block and no cylinder liners, had a challenging perception in the marketplace that was, frankly, reality, in that the early engines in particular wore out relatively quickly and became oil burners. As the years progressed, that really wasn't so much of an issue, but the reputation had fallen by that point. And it was even to the point where GM had relabeled the Vega engine, the Durabilt, in later years to signify changes that they had made to the overall engine as well as the cooling to show that it was not the same as what they started with. So anytime a company rebrands an engine, you know that it's probably trouble. So the engine came out in 1977. And remember, GM's trying to right some of the wrongs, if you will, from the Vega. And they want a fuel-efficient engine that can be put in the, a number of upcoming smaller cars. This is during the time where GM is evaluating the reboot of the whole portfolio because of fuel economy regulations from rear-wheel drive to front-wheel drive for packaging. And so in that context, General Motors tries to develop a new four-cylinder engine. And they set out a number of goals. And these are set forth in the actual Society of Automotive Engineers, or SAE paper, that was published describing Pontiac's new four-cylinder engine. Those goals were, number one, minimize noise and vibration, which is going to be humorous for those of you who have owned an Iron Duke-powered engine. But yes, that was the number one goal that's listed in that paper. If you don't believe me, look right there. Also, maximize usable power. And then, subsequently, make sure that it has excellent durability, drivability, and performance. And GM really looked to inspiration from an engine that they had in Brazil that displaced 2.5 liters. In Brazil, they had taken the Chevy 2 four-cylinder from years past. It was 153 cubic inches. 
and they had shortened the stroke from three and a quarter inches to three inches and they had enlarged the bore to four inches to keep it at the same cubic inch size but really made it a shorter stroke and then bigger bore engine. The thought behind this was that that kind of a design would enable reducing the secondary vibration forces that are often present in a four cylinder. And because GM didn't want to include a balance shaft, both for cost and serviceability reasons, and they even say in the paper for noise reasons, which is kind of funny because I haven't heard a balance shaft be overly noisy, but that's what they say in this paper. They copied that philosophy from Brazil, and consequently, what did the Iron Duke have? A four inch bore and a three inch stroke. And it also used aluminum pistons, similar to the Pontiac V8s of the time, with the attempt to try to reduce reciprocating mass. And the thought was all of this was going to drive reduced engine vibration and noise. Well, uh, yeah, I would say good thought. We'll get to more of that in a second. But also remember that I talked about usable power. What does that mean? And in the paper, they outlined that they wanted to make sure that this engine had peak torque at relatively low RPMs so that they could have numerically low axle ratios in vehicles to keep the engine turning slowly to get maximum fuel economy and for that to occur at around 55 miles per hour because remember back then the double nickel or 55 mile an hour speed limit was in place in the US. Hence what gets birthed out of this entire process a full cast iron heads and block as opposed to the Vega that had the aluminum block and the iron heads this has a full cast iron block for durability relatively low, by General Motors standards at least, reciprocating mass engine. And that's really the birth story of the Iron Duke. So different philosophy from, remember, Pontiac, who was responsible for the design of this, had come out with, in 1961, the Trophy four-cylinder, which was quite literally a half of a 389 V8. If never, none of you have seen that, it's one of the funkiest engines that GM came out with and it literally is half of a 389. <laughs> you can look at it and you can see one bank of cylinders is missing, the other one is cocked over 45 degrees. And uh, yeah, that actually didn't work all that horribly in the Tempest. It was a pretty torquey engine. But they wanted to go with a different approach to even reduce more vibration. And if you've ever seen a Tempest engine out of tune and the shake that that thing has, good God, uh, it would be like an earthquake in California. So that was the intent behind the Iron Duke. It was released and it made over the course of its lifetime anywhere from 85 to 110 horsepower. It never really was all that powerful for most of its life. It was making in the 90-ish, low 90s horsepower. And it did start out as a carbureted vehicle or carbureted engine and progressed to, to have in 1982 throttle body injection, at which point it got labeled the Tech 4. So car and driver at the time ridiculed it as the low-tech four because nothing was really high-tech about this. It had a distributor-based ignition. It was an overhead valve, not overhead cam. It had throttle body injection, not port fuel injection. Really had nothing sexy about it. It was not a high-tech engine. But nonetheless, marketing is mar what marketing is. It was labeled the Tech 4 in 1982. And it soldiered on for a number of years in relatively similar uh, guys until 1985 where it got some internal updates. The big update though came in 1987 when it went to a serpentine belt as opposed to the individual belts and crank triggered ignition. And then in 1988 it got another big revision to get balance shafts. Finally, so from 1977 to 1988 this 2.5 liter four-cylinder, a big four-cylinder, had no balance shafts. And this is really what puts this 2.5 liter Iron Duke engine on my worst of list for General Motors engines of the time period. And let me say that I own a car with this and I've owned many cars with it and I would own more. If you're looking for something that is reliable, durable, and often the vehicles that these are found in are cheap now. So they went in everything from the A-bodies, the Celebrity 6000 Century Sierras, to the Camaros and Firebirds, to the S10 pickup, 
to the Grumman LLV postal vehicles of the time, to the end cars when they came out in 1985, the Calais and the Somerset. This thing was everywhere, generally as the base engine. And it was generally reliable. It was generally durable. It did give good fuel economy. I've owned a number of these cars and I've routinely been able to get 30, 31, 32 miles per gallon on the freeway, which that's pretty good for a car of that era, especially with just a three-speed automatic transmission. But here's the downfall of it. They are crude, they are rude, they are noisy, and they're almost offensively so, particularly in the pre-balance shaft times. Once you get to the balance shaft Iron Dukes uh, in 1988 and later, that criticism goes away. But if you're talking about the Iron Duke, particularly the Tech 4 era, the 1982 to 1988, or sorry, 1987 models, they are really, really crude and noisy. A lot of the noise comes from, in some cases, the valve train or even the fiber optic cam gear that was pressed onto the bottom, uh, to the end of the camshaft and interfaced with the crankshaft. There's no timing chain on these, at least in the earlier years. And this is one of the Achilles heels of the engine, is that that fiber optic gear, the teeth, eventually shred themselves and then the camshaft stops turning. But it also makes a clackety noise which contributes to the engine's, I don't know what I would call it, uh, character or uh, distinct puttering sound that it makes, which you'll hear if a mail truck drives by. Uh, because or one of these old Grumman LLV mail trucks drives by. So if you compare, imagine you were walking into a Pontiac dealership or an Olds dealership or whatever it might have been in 1982, 1980 even, let's say. You're buying an X car, a Citation or a Phoenix, and you have been driving for the last several years V8-powered, rear-wheel drive, intermediate or full-size cars. And now for the same price, you're looking at something that's a front-wheel drive car that's more compact, powered by this four-cylinder engine. It's just gonna be a night and day difference. The V8s that GM was producing, particularly in the 60s and into the early 70s, and even through the mid-70s, yes, they were smogged, yes, they were down on power, but they were still smooth. If you were driving that and you traded that in for a car that had this Iron Duke engine, you would be supremely disappointed. Supremely. I enjoy these cars with these engines now as a memory. And like I said, they're reliable. But if I had been a customer back in the day looking for a new car and I went to go test drive this, I would have thought, what in the world is under the hood here? I mean, it sounds like a series of gerbils that are pedaling on a wheel. I mean, it's, it's really that bad. And unfortunately, I think that the engine really wasn't as bad inherently as it, it kind of came off in the vehicle integration. And what do I mean by that? For whatever reason, likely fuel economy and emissions, when you put these cars into drive and they're at curb idle when warm, the idle speed is relatively low. And that contributes to this sense of secondary vibrations that you feel through the steering wheel, the dashboard. In a lot of these cars, the vibration was so bad that the steering wheel would flutter at idle and even the dashboard would shake. Imagine what the perception is of a customer who test drives a car like that. It's just terrible. But that's how it was. The amazing thing about it is I've cured that issue for all of my cars that I've owned this by simply turning up the throttle stop screw. Now you have to punch out a little hole, which is not hard. It's a very soft plug in the throttle body. And then you can adjust the curb idle speed when warm. And all I do is I raise it by about 50-ish, 75 RPMs. That's all that's needed. And if you do that, the vibration goes away say it goes away, but it really attenuates or goes down significantly. 
it's such a little fix. But in terms of the customer perception, it makes such a big difference. And I will say in the X cars, I have one of these in an 84 Olds Omega. It's, it's really a pleasant motor. It's not fast, but it moves away from a stoplight relatively smartly. Gets great mileage. And I will say as a, <clears throat> a memory of the past, it is kind of fun, which is why I keep that car. Uh, it's just, it's a fun conversation piece. But again, if you had been in the market at the time and you had been driving GM cars from the past with V8 engines that were wonderfully smooth, you would have been supremely disappointed. And especially if you went down the street to the Honda or Toyota dealer. I've also had Honda Civics, Accords of the time. The four-cylinder engines in those cars compared to the Iron Duke in terms of smoothness, especially not just the engine, but you get a Honda manual transmission from the era. Oh my God. Honda manual transmissions, even from the eighties are still the benchmark in terms of shifting effort and smoothness. If you've never driven one, you're missing a true treat. And I even had a Honda, an 85 Honda CRX for some time that I loved, loved the engine. Uh, I ended up selling it because it had, I think about 55 vacuum hoses under the hood. And there were so many that they were labeled from the factory, one through 55. Uh, and some of them were cracking each year. And I just got tired of trying to figure out which one cracks. And I think there were like six solenoids under hood for the carburetor. And it was a three barrel carburetor, which I couldn't get parts for. So it was a fun car, but I had enough of the experience. These cars, by contrast, you can still get parts for them if you find a car with this engine. I wouldn't hesitate to buy one. There's not a lot of watchouts. The only thing I would say is, <clears throat> even though the SAE paper brags that the durability testing included 100 hours at full throttle at 4,500 RPMs, I would not rev these engines, especially if you've got it in a Fiero. Don't rev it north of 4,000 RPMs. You're asking for trouble. I don't care what the red line says. The crankshaft on these is not overly strong. And there's no sense in doing it. It doesn't make any more power at that upper RPM range. So in any case, I hope that that explains a bit why I would put this on the worst list. Again, not because of reliability or durability. It was pretty good uh, in terms of everyday reliability. The durability, I would say the biggest issue is that camshaft gear getting chewed up and then the camshaft stopping, uh, stop spinning. And I've seen that happen at you know, around 100,000 miles, 130,000 miles. It depends on how the vehicle is driven. If it's in like a five speed S10 pickup with a, an overdrive fifth speed, it'll last longer. If the car has been driven on the freeway at 90 miles an hour for a long time, these motors are turning pretty quick on the freeway at 70 miles an hour. Typical ones turning at about 2,500 RPMs. You know, at, you go 80, then it's turning 2750, somewhere in that zip code. It's pretty fast when the red line is 4500-ish. So if you just drive them normally and they've been driven normally, you're gonna be fine. And they should be pretty reliable for you. They don't have head gasket issues or intake gasket issues. They're just kind of noisy. And good luck changing the distributor cap and rotor, particularly on the X cars. That is a chore can't really get it from the bottom well you have to get it from the top my best advice is to undo the dog bone mount on the non-balance shaft ones and rock the motor forward by the time the balance shaft came around in an 87 they had crank triggered ignition but the distributors on the back side way down on the motor and it's tough to get at and often people don't replace it so if you find one that's not running right check the distributor cap and rotor when i bought my 84 Ozil Omega, it didn't run quite right didn't have that much power it only had 15,000 miles Somebody had put new plugs and wires on it. I don't think they thought that it had a distributor in it because you couldn't see it. But there it was. It's back there. I guarantee it is. In any case, hope you enjoyed this little chit, uh, porch chat on the Iron Duke engine. Don't be afraid to buy one. Have a little piece of history. And just like the Cadillacs equipped with a 4.1 liter engine, don't worry about getting anywhere in a hurry because you're not going to be successful. Stay in the right lane. Relax. Kick back. Put on some music and enjoy the ride. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching this video on the worst engine of all time, talking about the GM 2.5 liter Iron Duke four cylinder. If you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe 
as well as drop a few comments as that helps the YouTube algorithm serve it up to more people. And you can also subscribe by clicking the circular icon of the 67 Buick Riviera at the top left. And while you're at it, check out a few videos suggested for you, one on the bottom left, and then a playlist of the best of, worst of, including chats similar to this on the bottom right. Thanks again for watching and take care.